Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at the Diamond DA40NG. Uh, this is a really, really slick plane because it not only gives us the performance of a relatively fast and expensive plane, but it's also pretty easy to fly like a lot of the planes that came before it, such as the Cessna 172. Uh, we're currently sitting right over here, um, we're basically in western Turkey, and uh, way off to the east is going to be Istanbul as well as the Bosphorus, which we're going to be taking a look at in just a moment. We have a relatively short runway we're going to be taking off from today, which is going to make things a little exciting for us, but at the same time, is this aircraft has got good performance and we should have no difficulty at all getting airborne. Let's go ahead and take a look inside. Now the first thing I notice when I climb into this plane is how incredibly good the visibility is. There's a lot of airplanes out there but very few civilian aircraft give you a view this clean. Of course it's a lot more glass to clean when you have to. The second thing I notice is everything is nice and streamlined. I love using center sticks. It gives you a nice control. Notice there's a simple fuel valve here which is actually going to give us some problems later as you're going to see. We have all the electronics we need right Right in front of us, everything looks good, easy to read instrumentation, and we can sit four. Although realistically, if uh, we're carrying a full load of fuel like we are today, you're not going to be able to fit four people in here. So let's go ahead and get this thing started and uh, take us on our flight, and I'll comment on some of the interesting features of this, especially this button right here. Now, this is going to be an interesting experience for some folks if they haven't flown this one before, but uh, we'll get into that in just a minute. So let's go ahead and get everything going. Uh, first things first is we want to turn on the electric master. So I'm actually going to flip this to the on position. Uh, normally when you do this, we check to make sure everything's working properly. You'd hear a little fan. That's our avionics fan. It'd be giving us kind of a heads up to let us know that everything is okay with the aircraft. Notice uh, we have our two G1000 displays here. This is, again, a really, really easy to use setup. We've seen uh, videos on that itself. Normally we'd be telling our passengers now, okay, Okay, this is what you need to do in an emergency. The G1000, we'd fire it up. We double check to make sure we're carrying fuel. You can see we're carrying a full tank, both on the right side as well as the left tank. We'd be checking our fuel temperature. We don't have to worry about that today, so we're not going to check it. Uh, we need to do total time. We'd be recording our, you know, tack time and everything along those lines. And we come up to here and we turn on our strobe light. Now, as soon as I hit that, we're going to get a little light going on on the tail to let everybody know around us we're about to get this thing started. So starting this aircraft is very, very simple, and that's actually one of the things I love about it. Basically, what you're going to do is you're going to look around and make sure that the propeller area is clear. You're going to come over to this thing that says Engine Master. You're going to flip it to the on position. I'm going to go ahead and seal that sucker back up. We're going to double check to make sure there's no scary warnings. I notice I've got this thing for glow that just came on a moment ago. It's gone out. We're going to go ahead and make sure the fuel is turned on, which it is. We're not going to touch the throttle control because we don't need to. And all we're going to do is just crank it until it starts. Clear prop. And that's it. That's really all there is to starting. There's no, you know, craziness. Remember, this is a FADEC aircraft, so it's full authority digital engine control. It's going to do all the hard work for us and let us concentrate on actually operating the airplane instead. As usual, we want to be idling at about 1,000 RPM or so, give or take, so that the engine can warm up and we don't get any lead stuck in our spark plugs. So now that we're started, it's uh, time to start thinking about doing the last bits and pieces. We want to make sure we've got ourselves some oil temperature, some oil pressure. Our coolant, yes, this is a water-cooled engine, is uh, going to be coming up and getting warmer in a moment. Our fuel temperature looks quite nominal there. Our GPS and everything has all been preset. I'm actually going to change my CDI mode here. We're going to go to this mode. We do have an automatic pilot built into this aircraft, so, so we're going to go ahead and get that set up. Cruise altitude today since we're going to be traveling roughly eastward it's going to take us up to about 3,000 feet we're going to make sure that's kind of preset our normal climb speed in this aircraft is going to get us about 700 feet per minute so I'm going to go ahead and set that up real quickly right now I'll make sure that's set the way I want it to be flip on my flight director okay looks good looks good and of course none of this works because I haven't turned on the avionics master. Now we should be able to get some of that stuff on. I'm looking at an older handbook here that was for a version that did not have a G1000. Okay, now we can start getting all that good stuff set up. Go ahead and set this up to about 500 feet per minute. It's going to be pretty good. Altitude's been preset. We've already checked that out. We've checked that out. Obviously, we're going to be doing a navigation hold mode once we do get airborne in just a minute. And we're basically going to be using the GPS to get us to our destination. Now, with all that information all set, I'm just going to take a look around and make sure we're not going to mow anybody down. I'm going to pretend this man is not standing here. Um, just kind of look away when I uh, chop him up with the repeller in just a second. And we'll go ahead and get rolling. Normally, what you'd be doing, of course, is you'd be checking to make sure the flaps work. You'd put them all the way down, look out the window. We'd be popping them all the way back up. We'd be checking our trim. We'd be doing our automatic pilot check. We'd make sure that our transponder is enabled. I'm going to go down to transponder right now, flip it to the on position. We're going to be taking off in a moment, so I might as well just flip it to the alternator, I should say altitude, not alternator mode. Parking brake would get released, and basically this thing has more than enough thrust to get us going right away. 
Now, there's an interesting piece of trivia here. If you take a look at the parking situation here with our brakes, in the older version of this aircraft, when you taxied it on the ground, you did not have a steerable nose wheel. As a matter of fact, if you look, I'm hitting the rudders back and forth, but the front wheel does not turn. You use differential braking to turn this aircraft on the ground. In the real world, it's actually kind of a pain in the butt to do it that way, but fortunately for us, we're not going to have to worry about that because Flight Simulator was nice enough to kind of build it in for us, make our lives a little bit simpler. Okay. Let's go ahead and get rolling here. I'm just taking a look at the last couple items here, making sure I'm not missing anything on my checklist. Looks pretty good. Let's get going. Again, like I said, just ignore that gentleman in front of us. He's not really there. I'm going to get rolling very, very aggressively. Of course, see how it kind of streamlines just a teeny tiny bit into the wind. Nothing unusual with that at all. Go ahead and give us a little bit of power here. Again, it's going to be a little awkward steering this thing on the ground because of that funky differential braking business. Nice and easy, nice and easy come up to our first runway here. I love these little tiny runways. They're so cute. All right, looking pretty good. We're going to be uh, taking off with no flaps today. We're going to go and flip on our pitot heat just in case we need it for later. Also, before we enter the runway, we want to make sure we're in altitude mode. I'm going to go double check everything real quickly. We're going to flip on our strobe light, which is just a nice little, I should say, our position lights, just as a nice little handy thing to kind of let everybody around us know that we're getting ready to go. Give this thing a little bit of power. And now to line us up at the runway. Now the rotation speed on this aircraft varies depending on your takeoff weight. We're pretty high up there. We're about 1,100 kilograms, which is going to get us a rotation speed of about 61 knots. I'm just going to look out the window here, make sure nobody's coming up on the approach. It looks pretty good to me. Go ahead. And we're going to need as much runway as we can get. All right. Looks pretty good. I'll hold that brake down. This thing loves to take off on you, literally and figuratively. I'm going to go ahead and flip on our landing light. Last second checks real quick. Everything looks good. Looks good. We're going to be taking off, taking a left turn. We're going to avoid things. 61 knots. Once we get in the air, we're going to be holding up 72 knots. We could also hold about 88 knots if you want to do like a cruise climb, but for today, we're just going to go ahead and do it. I'm going to smoothly apply full power. There's no propeller handle on this aircraft, so you don't have to worry about it. It's going to do this little bouncing thing like it does just in the real world. Release the brake and get ready to use your feet. Notice our load meter indicates 90%, even though I'm at full throttle. I'm looking for 61 knots. Sixty-one. Up we go. Now my instinct immediately says, put up your flaps. Don't need to. Put up your gear. Don't need to. All right, now we're going to be climbing at a speed of 72 knots, which is roughly what I have it at now. I'm going to go ahead and bring the aircraft to the left real quickly. And we're going to see this lovely lake that we just can't started ripping around. Of course, in the real world, I imagine there'd be tons of people in their little sailboats and powerboats and everything like that just kind of zipping around. And again, this is, like I said, Western Turkey, so it's going to be a little bumpy on the way out, but things should stabilize once we get closer to Istanbul. Now, this aircraft, theoretically, at a heavy maximum load and correct technique, you should be able to get about 700 feet per minute as your default climb rate. But in this case, I'm going to be holding the nose down a little bit to get us a slightly faster climb rate. And oh, what is that over in the distance? Hmm, we'll find out in a minute. And it's also, of course, going to make sure that uh, things don't go too, too crazy as far as speed goes. You know, I don't want to be flying completely flat here. One thing you probably notice over on the right is my load meter has just gotten really grumpy with me. It says that I'm past maximum load there. And it's actually not past, it's getting close to maximum load. Basically, the uh, engine control on this system is saying, hey, uh, you know, you're, you're really being a little rough on us. Do you mind reducing power a little bit? So we're actually going to take our throttle and pull it back just a teeny tiny bit. We just want to get that load back into the green. Don't worry about the RPM too much, at least not in a climb. Now, if we wanted a maximum performance climb, we could pull this nose up quite a bit and actually hold it there and basically hang off our propeller. Whenever you do that, of course, uh, you're going to make things go to quite a bit hotter at the same time as um, it's going to be a little less comfortable for your passengers because your nose is going to be, you know, 14, 15 degrees. Obviously, as you start getting really, really high, we can start adjusting things like that as well. All right, I'm going to stick my head out the window again, just kind of take a look around. Look at how high the nose is here. That is one tall office building. All right, I can hold the nose up even higher if I wanted to, but again, that's going to get, like I said, a little uncomfortable, and you're going to get things pretty hot. Good time to go ahead and flip off our landing lights now that we've gotten ourselves cruising up quite a bit. And we're just going to kind of stabilize and enjoy this part of the flight. There we go, a little bit of trim. This aircraft has a handy-dandy little electric trim button right in the middle. 
it's kind of easy to use. The only problem with electric trim is you never can quite get it exactly where you want it to be. You're always going to be going up, down, up, down, just trying to find that magical spot where it's perfectly well balanced. Just about getting up to altitude here. Now, one of the interesting things with this aircraft is because it has a power level versus a lever, rather, versus just a throttle, it's going to give us a little bit less control over our actual cruise settings. As a matter of fact, what we're going to do is set the cruise based on a certain percentage of load. Once it's been established, the engine is basically going to do the work for us as far as making sure everything is the correct air fuel mixture. It's going to make sure it's the correct RPM and everything along those lines. It's definitely a simplified and very, very modern take on an aircraft. I'm just going to go ahead and line myself up quite neatly with our little course planned out here. Aircraft like this, uh, generally you're going to be using the GPS for most of your navigation. Just keeps things simple. But of course you can do things conventionally as well. There we are. Go ahead and level ourselves out here. Get just a tiny bit more altitude. I don't want to be too, too low. A little bit of turbulence today, but nothing too, too scary. I think I'm going to enjoy the view just a little bit. you got a nice little track right there. A little river, a couple apartment complexes, most likely, if I had to guess. Pretty good size of a city here. Again, we're very, very close to Istanbul. My understanding was Istanbul was Constantinople. Let's take my head up just a teeny tiny bit there. It looks like we're going to dodge the clouds quite nicely at 3,000 feet today. Bring myself gently to the right. I can flip on the autopilot in just a minute. For now, I'm just kind of keeping it easy. That looks pretty good right about there. Ah, these modern aircraft are just so easy to fly. Yeah, actually, I'm going to come to my right just a teeny tiny bit. It really, it feels like a slightly more maneuverable Cessna 172. In the real world, the controls are actually, in, at least in my opinion, just a little bit heavier than a Cessna 172, but they both are very, very similar handling, especially performance-wise. Now, here's where the magic is going to start. I'm going to go ahead and finish leveling off here. Get my autopilot ready. Notice my nose is slightly up. There we go. Flip on the automatic pilot. Now, since we took the trouble to set everything up already, I can just basically let go. All right, so now how does cruising in this particular aircraft work? Well, it's pretty straightforward. All we're going to do is we're going to pull this power level back until it gets to a specific percentage. Maximum performance cruise would be setting it to 92% power. So if I push the handle just a tiny bit forward, and this says 92, this is absolute peak cruise. We are going the maximum speed we can possibly safely get this aircraft up to. What you're probably observing is our RPM right now is basically redlining. So we are pushing this aircraft absolutely as hard as it can, but it is considered to be an acceptable power for this particular aircraft. Now notice, we're still accelerating, but we're getting about, let's see here, our ground speed is averaging about 133 knots, which is amazing for the amount of horsepower that this aircraft possesses. So the other possibility for cruise, of course, would be something like an economy cruise. Now the way we do that is we're just gonna go ahead and back the power up until it's a 60% load. Yes, you can fly this thing that low. So you want to be gentle because as you pull the power back, the aircraft is going to slow down, which is going to make your load actually come down on its own. So you want to be very gentle with it, that you don't overdo it. Be nice and see. We just got to get close. Nope, too much. Push it forward just a teeny tiny bit. Yeah, it's about just right. Perfect. Okay. Now you can see we're slowing down quite a bit here, but we're still making pretty good speed. And of course, if you take a look, I'm doing 6.1 gallons per hour right now, which is amazing. Most aircraft of this class, you're gonna be averaging right around nine or 10 gallons per hour, even more depending on how old the aircraft is, of course. So now it's time to go ahead and take a look at fuel management. Now this aircraft has an interesting quirk when it comes to fuel. Hey, the Hagia Sophia, I recognize that anywhere. Do I? Yeah. Okay. So in this aircraft, you have a left fuel tank and a right fuel tank. And you're probably going, okay, so where's the handle for that? I don't see a left and a right. That's because this aircraft does not have that particular feature. This aircraft instead has a fuel transfer pump. What this does is when I press this button on, it starts to transfer 
fuel from one fuel tank to the other one. As a matter of fact, you're going to get a little warning here that's going to tell you that that fuel pump is now operating. So what's happening is we're not actually running off the other fuel tank. Instead, what we're doing is sucking fuel out of the right wing of the aircraft, shoving it through this pump, and then dumping it into the left wing of the aircraft, and then, of course, sucking that fuel out and proceeding directly to a propeller hanging off the front of this thing. So as a result, it feels like we're running off the right fuel tank, but in reality, we're still coming out of the left fuel tank. And that's why you've got that little teeny tiny arrow there next to that fuel transfer button. That's kind of a weird surprise that some people are not used to who've you know, flown other types of aircraft like this before. So I'm going to go ahead and bring our power back up to 92%. Keep in mind you don't want to just jam it at 92% because the moment you do so, as the aircraft accelerates, the load will increase. I know that sounds unintuitive, but that's just how it works. Okay. Taking a look at my little fuel gauge, do you see how the right is starting to shift leftwards? And you can see how the left one is actually shifting slightly rightwards as you start to fill back up in that tank. So basically, it's a way not only to balance the aircraft, but it's a way to simplify the fuel management system. It's just something that most folks aren't used to. Now, if you wanted to, you could actually leave the fuel transfer pump on. And that, of course, would mean that you're going to basically be running out of the right tank through the left tank and then back through the engine. Like I said, it's a very different way to approach the fuel balancing kind of a problem. Obviously, it's not as simple as others. Yeah, look at this. We're almost completely neutral at this point. So it's a very unique feature, at least stuff from what I've seen. We're now crossing into Istanbul. Of course, the other side is going to be regular old Istanbul there, and you got the nice Bosphorus. Very, very, very strategic waterway. If you actually take a look kind of along this way, this is going to be how you get to the wonderful Black Sea right in the opposite side of things like this. Looking through, uh, this is an incredible, incredible place. I've always wanted to visit this basically as long as I've lived because I just, I think it's an incredible melding of so many different cultural things all in one place. All right, I'm going to go ahead and shut my fuel transfer pump off because uh, we've already balanced the fuel two fuel tanks pretty well at this point. And I'm just going to kind of enjoy the sights for just a moment here. And then we're going to go ahead and skip standing for landing. All right, looking pretty good on this side. Oh, that's so cool. Ah, oh, this is so wild. I expect a million boats, basically, to be going through this at any given time. And what I was really hoping to see, and unfortunately I don't see it, in, at least in this version of Flight Simulator, is those amazing bridges that they used to cross the uh, two pieces here. Otherwise, I were stuck flying or were stuck taking a ferry across. Okay, uh, we're about six minutes away from our destination. I'm going to start thinking about landing the airplane now. Landing this aircraft is a little tricky because our wings are so long and they're so thin. So as a result, ground effect tends to really grab onto you and kind of hang onto it, at least in the real world. It's a little different when you get to the actual flight simulator itself. You know, you're not going to have quite that much of a bite when you get a couple feet off the ground. So I'm taking a look at my notes real quickly. It looks like our approach speed today, if we have our flaps up, it's going to be about 80 knots. Our approach speed with our flaps all all the way down are going to be right around probably going to be about 73 knots if we had to pick a speed it's probably going to be 72 knots it's going to be our absolute minimum approach now notice on the flaps you actually do have a takeoff position if you choose to do so uh, i chose not to because we had plenty of room to take off there but you can use that setting you can even approach to land with that setting but like i said we need all that extra drag we can get because of how easily this aircraft is going to glide forever across that runway oh there's one of the bridges and that is a lot less exciting than the bridge that goes, whoa, like that. But, eh, I'll take what I can get, kind of a thing like that. I do want to see the Sophia on the other side, though. All right. Should be right over here on my right. Ha, there they are. That's so cool. All right, let's uh, go ahead and jump. Whoa, look at that highway. Let's go ahead and jump back into the correct seat here. And prepare for our landing. So I'm going to go ahead and use the automatic pilot to make my life a little bit simpler here. I'm going to set it to a 1,500 foot beat. Go ahead to vertical speed mode. We're going to do 500 feet per minute. We're going to reduce the power to eh, usually about 75%. So it's more than enough, but we'll see exactly where we want to go. Remember, this aircraft is basically a glider. It's going to not lose energy quickly. We don't want to be going too, too far into the danger zone there. Because, again, we can go into the yellow. It's just not safe in high turbulence here. Go ahead and zoom out just a little bit on our map. Just want to see how we're doing. That looks pretty good. Nice, I'm making our slow approach here. Ah, there's another one. That's awesome. One of the coolest things is for those of you who do have VR is to use Google Earth VR to actually zip around all this. It's amazing some of the photographs people have taken here. Ah, I just miss all the boats. Oh well. All right, 
So we're just going to continue downwards. 500 feet per minute is a pretty safe descent speed almost all the time, if you ever had to guess. Because because we're not pressurized, anything past 500 feet per minute is going to be tremendously uncomfortable to our passengers. Because uh, their ears are not going to be tolerating that pressure change. 300 feet per minute is even safer if you're unpressurized. But again, it totally depends on your flight and your needs. And, you know, did you have a cold or something like that? That's going to have a big impact on it. All right, got to take a look around. This is just so incredible. I love that little haze you get. Oh, it's so nice. Uh, not too far from the Mediterranean. Oh, it's so amazing. Gently gliding here. Imagine the traffic here would be a lot more ferocious than I'm seeing in the simulator, but I'll take what I can get. Oh, there it is. I was wondering when that traffic would appear. All right, we're going to continue our gentle descent here. Again, we're about 60, 61, 62% power is going to be more than enough at 500 feet per minute to keep us going our cruise speed. Destination is about three minutes away. Good time to go ahead and take a look at some notes. Go ahead and use our G1000 here. We have this fancy, fancy dancy program over here where we could go ahead and actually dial in individual details that could enable us to go ahead and land. LTBX is what we're going to be interested in today. So we could actually, you know, might as well take advantage of our fancy technology while we're waiting. L T Bravo and X ray. Notice I haven't had to do anything with the air fuel mixture on this thing. The engine will do that for you on this aircraft. Enter, enter. So what this does now is this can now give you all sorts of useful information on this particular site. You know, if you had an airport directory, you could get all the details here. And again, we can see that our runway is going to be 18 and 36. It's north-south runway. Our wind today, let's go ahead and take a look at our PFD. We'll turn the wind on. Option three is the correct option. Looks like the wind's coming out of the west today, so it really doesn't matter which one of the two runways we're actually going to cross on. So what I'm most likely going to do is cross the center of the runway and do a left, a left, and a left, and go ahead and land the aircraft. Looks pretty good. Again, normally you get all sorts of frequencies and things like that. We could actually normally go like this and go down to that frequency. We could do an enter, enter, and actually load it into our standby, which you can see it did right here. So now we could swap to it and quickly communicate with it if we needed to. It's just another one of those awesome features that's built into this particular system. Go ahead and exit out of this because I won't need it because we're just about to land the plane in a moment. Go ahead and return the plane back up to about, we'll do about 85% power is plenty. This is a really, really, really nice aircraft as far as these things goes. So just one less thing to worry about. One thing you want to watch out for uh, when we are landing this aircraft is you want to be very cautious with this fuel transfer. Uh, obviously, you want to try to keep things as balanced as possible, but running that fuel transfer pump during landing, uh, you could run yourself into some problems. So generally what you do is you want to make sure there's just a little extra fuel in that left tank and just use your left tank for landing purposes. You know, we can't quickly switch tanks if we find that the engine dies on us. So we have to make sure we keep that thing nice and kind of filled in so we don't have too many issues with it during our particular landings. Again, it's just one more thing you're going to have to manage. You know, some folks will go ahead and just flip the switch on and just leave it there and not have to worry about it. I'm going to go ahead and flip on my landing light because I'm just about ready to land now. Stick my hand out the window. Again, I love the visibility on this aircraft. We are just a touch low, but that's okay. Basically uh, blitzing the buildings here. <laughs> Looks nice. Again, this is a wild airplane. For those of you who have fly the Cessna 172, you've got to try these diamonds out. They're going to give you very similar performance, but they're just slightly nicer. And I know that's uh, basically a quality opinion here, but I don't know, just the way that I feel with it. Of course, these in the real world are so much more expensive, and eh, you got to do with what you got to do, kind of a thing like that. All right, there is our destination. Go ahead and zoom in a little bit so you can take a good look at it. We're going to be landing this way. So we're going to normally in the real world, if we're flying VFR, we'd cross the middle of the runway. We'd find which way the sock is going. Of course, the sock tells us that the wind is coming from this direction. So, of course, now because of that, we're basically going to have to cross here, go left, 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 and come swinging around this way. It may actually be safer in the real world, and I would be surprised for this procedure, to actually fly a right traffic pattern. All right, you can take a look at the traffic. There's somebody down there waiting for us. Doesn't surprise me. All right, we're going to go ahead and cross the center, like I said, and get the aircraft nice and ready to land. All right, let's flip back to normal view. We'll turn off the automatic pilot. And we're going to go ahead and start slowing down. Remember, like I said, in the real world, this would be the check the flag step. Looks good, looks good. And I'm just going to assume the flag is going to be crossing. Oh, we do have a runway 22. Oh, did not say that in the directory. I'm just going to take a peek at that runway 22. No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Let's go ahead and take runway 18 instead. 
All right, the way we do the traffic pattern in this aircraft is very simple. We're simply going to bring the nose up. Once we get under the magical speed there of 110, we're going to go ahead and drop one notch of flaps. That's going to get you slowing down very quickly. Go ahead and line ourselves up with the rest of the correct runway here. Try to keep yourself at traffic pattern altitude. All right, we're going to go ahead and start our descent into our final approach. The nice thing about a north-south runway, of course, is that it's north-south. You just point it north. Look at the window, check everything looks good, check everything looks good. All right, we normally would just go ahead and drop our next notch of flaps now. And we're going to go ahead and take a nice and high base here. I'm going to go ahead and make sure my fuel transfer pump is in the off position. We don't need to tempt fate with that. Again, we're doing a modified approach because we're a little low for this traffic pattern, but that's okay. Again, normally we'd be doing about 500 feet per minute. We're waiting to get basically at a 45 degree angle to the end of the runway, holding my nose up a little extra here because like I said, we're awfully close to this runway. One of the cool tricks, by the way, is you can always just zoom in and you can look visually on the map if we hit 45 like we just did. All right, so now we need to get this aircraft ready to go. We need 72 knots, full notches of flaps. We need to make sure everything else is ready to go in the aircraft. Swing us around. Again, I love the visibility. You just look and there's no window there. That's just amazing. Generally, we'd be descending at about 500 feet per minute. So I'm going to hold the nose up just a little bit more here. We don't need to be doing anything too aggressive. Since, like I said, the wind is coming out of the west today, we're now pointing dead into it. So we're going to have a bit of a crosswind landing, but that's okay. There's the end of our runway, studying it carefully. Remember, when we turn out from this crosswind landing, we're going to point slightly to the right in order to safely cross it. There's our 72 knots, just like I promised. Come around nice and gently. Good time for a gumfuls check. Gas, yep, undercarriage, mixture, propeller, flaps, lights, speed. Good to go. Again, some of those elements are actually completely eliminated because you have that FADEX system on this aircraft. Good time to check to make sure everything looks good. Right, we're a little fast now. Remember, we've got that crosswind coming from the right. So we're gonna point slightly to the right here. All right, looks good. We're going uh, pretty fast here. Remember, because we basically have glider wings, any extra speed you carry into this landing is gonna make it take you that much longer. You really got to use those flaps. I'm just keeping the uh, nose basically pointing right at the number, just like an inch or two above. We're going to go ahead and pass everybody on our landing. Again, there's a 72 knots. Now, when you go to come down on this plane, if you have that extra speed, it's going to take a lifetime to touch down. So you've got to have good rudder control in order to safely touch down. There we go. Let the nose come down on its own. And I'm going to gently apply the brakes. Oh, apparently we need a lot of windsock here. And there is our successful landing. Not bad at all. A little bit faster on the approach, and I probably should have come from a slightly higher altitude, but it was a pretty good improvisation, not too, too bad. Again, look at the amount of population in this area. Shutting this aircraft down is, of course, relatively simple as well. I'm just going to pull myself out of the way. We'll pretend that we've already gone up directly up to where we need to park this thing. Come back to my right just a teeny bit. Again, clear the field just in case. Hold the brakes. So normally all we'd have to do is that we go ahead and just shut off the engine master. That's all there is to it. Generally though, we want to shut off our avionics. Interestingly enough that in the real world when you hit the switch, these usually shut off too, but that's okay. I'm going to come here, flip that switch off, and the engine's going to die pretty much right away as fast as you do that. And that's all there is to it. I'm going to go ahead and set this to the off position. Shut the power off in the aircraft. And we're good to go. Hopefully this video helps. Again, this is a really neat aircraft. It's got that kind of weird quirk with that fuel pump system. But other than that, it's a great starter plane because it simplifies a lot of what you've probably seen differently in other aircrafts. Enjoy.